Dude, I'm shipping this so hard. Oh my god, just kiss already. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god, just kiss already. I'm waiting for it. Hi guys, welcome to chapter 8 of the Caster Saga. If you're new here, we have about 7 videos before this. Just letting you know. Spoiler alert, this is chapter 8. Chapter 8. The Forest of Darkness. Everyone looked around and Tony counted. They were all there. All 13 of them were accounted for, but Melly didn't look good. She was knelt down on the tracks and appeared to be crying. Tony and Rose came over to her and saw that her forehead was bleeding and had been slashed open. Oh no! What's wrong? Melly's hurt. Everyone came over and gathered close, but Melly stood up and brushed Tony off. I'm fine, Tony. Melly, just here, let me help you. I said I'm fine. Does anyone know anything about healing? I have a book that has several healing spells in it. Will you look, please? Chrissy and the others looked in the little book for a spell, but Melly was still bleeding, badly. Here, Melly. Tony pulled out a cloth that had been wrapped around his knife when the angel spirit first gave it to him. He wrapped it around Melly's hand, then pressed her hand against her cut. Keep pressure applied to it. Melly nodded and sat down on the tracks. Thanks, Tony. Tony nodded, then stood up beside her, looking over at the others with a very serious expression. Did you find anything? I did. Look at this. She brought it over to Tony, and he read from her book with her. Ben and Sam stood farthest away from the rest of the group, mumbling to each other and themselves. I thought when someone was injured or killed, you left them beside the tracks for the beast to take. Yeah, if she's hurt, we should just leave her and keep moving. Rose heard what they said, and gave them a dirty look. Are you too stupid or something? This girl is sticking her neck out for us. We can't just leave her. Who said we should leave her? They did. Rose pointed at Ben and Sam, and Tony walked over to them with an angry look on his face. If you two want to go off on your own, be my guest. But we won't be leaving anyone behind unless there's nothing else we can do for them. The rules of the train ride say that you watch your partner's back and no one else's. If you're alone, then you're on your own. And that girl... Tony pointed to Melly, who looked away from them with a sad look. He spoke loudly, making Ben and Sam kind of smirk at him. Is my partner! Tony stepped towards them with a look of pure hatred and anger radiating from behind his eyes. If you say anything else about leaving anyone behind, I will personally feed you to the beast myself. Oh, really now? Yeah, you sure got some confidence for a normo. Sam and Ben laughed despite Tony being older, taller, and stronger than them. Tony had gone this whole trip maintaining his good nature and keeping himself well-tempered, but at this point, he figured Sam and Ben needed to be put in their place. Not only were they younger than him, but they were acting like children, and he'd had enough. He'd been called a normo for the last time. Tony had a growl to his voice as his eyes lit up purple, and he took him each by the throat, lifting them above his head. Tony wasn't acting on his own thoughts. He was acting on his caster instincts. Melly shouted, trying to get through to him. Tony, put them down! Tony heard Melly behind him, but he was in full caster mode, and he held them there frozen for a moment before putting them down and letting his eyes return to normal. Thank you. Now, come here, please. Tony glared at Ben and Sam, then walked back over to Melly. He took her fingers gently in his hand and spoke in a soft tone of voice. I'm sorry if I was out of line. Melly shook her head and spoke with a serious expression on her face. Not at all. Rule number seven. Always be nice to everyone, because once you're mean, they won't think of you as nice anymore. So always be nice to everyone. Tony nodded a little disappointed at himself, but then she finished her sentence, which made him feel all the better. That is, until it's time to be mean. Then destroy them. She looked up and walked over to Ben and Sam, giving them a sorrowful and sad look. You're right, boys. You don't need to worry about me. You should be worried about yourselves. After all... You don't make it through alive anyways. She turned away from them and then walked back over to Tony. What do you mean we don't make it through alive? Hey, hey, hey girl, uh, Marissa, M Melissa, hey, how do you know if we make it through or not? Melly slowly turned around and looked at the two boys with a sad look on her face. Because you don't care about anyone but yourselves. You can be the strongest caster ever born and still not make it to the Garden of Lily because you're selfish. Ben and Sam looked scared as Melly turned away from them again. 
Chrissy, did you find anything? Huh? Oh, yeah. Uh, Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, There's this one I think might work, but we don't have the potion we need for it. Well, what's it called? I'm sure we could probably whip something up real quick. It's called Angel's Tears? Oh, hey, I actually have some of that. Do you, Tony? I do. Tony dug through his little bag and found the glass-like bottle. He opened it as Melly stood beside him, looking relieved. Thank you, Tony. Of course, you're my partner. Now, what's it say, Chrissy? Careful, Tony. It's extremely potent. It'll only take one drop in the injury to heal it. Okay. Melly, hold still. Tony double-checked the bottle, then opened it, and slowly let one drop of the liquid fall into Melly's wound. The injury glowed a golden color, and then a light aqua blue color, and finally healed completely after about two minutes. Tony closed the bottle and put it back into his bag on his belt. He ran his thumb over Melly's forehead and smiled, then tilted her head up with his fingers gently under her chin. There we go. All better. Now, what's the plan, Melly? I would have healed, Tony. Yes, but now you're all better, so it was worth it. Melly smiled and spoke quietly as they all gathered around her. Well, first thing I think we should do is set up camp for the night here and rest. Gather some food of some kind, maybe, and then in the morning, go into the forest darkness. I think if we do one forest per day, we should be able to keep our strength and sanity and watch each other's backs. Why not go through the forest of darkness now? Day or night, it'll still probably be dark. I mean, it is in the name, after all. I don't know about you, but I'm tired, Sam. Besides, I think it would be smarter to have the time to set up camp. We go through the forest now, and it'll be nighttime and dark when we reach the other side, and we'll be left without a camp at night. I think we should at least make a couple small fires and get some food in us. On top of that, the forest will take longer to get through, because it's dark. No light can be seen there. Not even our eyes will glow there. I was wondering about that. How did we do that? My eyes have never done that before. I guess you just tapped your magic when we all did. Huh. I've never done that before. Me either. Tony smiled at them, then looked at Melly with the same mischievous smile he gave her when they were standing on the back of the train together. What? Nothing. Just thinking. Thinking what? We all need to work together to get through, huh, Melly? Like a little tribe. I am so done with this. Psh, tribe. You can play cowboys and Indians if you want to. I'm going through the forest now. You come in, Sam? Right behind you, Ben. They walked past the group and followed the tracks towards the forest. Jacob watched them leave, then looked at Tony and Melly. They really aren't going to make it, are they? I wouldn't bet on it. Melly gave him a small smile and shrugged her shoulders. Try not to think about it, Jacob. Call me Jake. Melly smiled and nodded, then looked at Tony as he spoke. Those two seem to be filled with nothing but anger. It even spilled over onto me. They don't have a shred of love for anyone but themselves. Rule number eight, Tony. When love is involved, they must love you entirely, as you are, and unconditionally. Or not at all. Those two haven't seen real love a day in their lives, so I don't expect them to have any for their fellow casters either. Tony nodded, agreeing with what she said. Then she sighed and looked around them, trying to decide what to do next. (sighs) Time to set up camp, I guess. Sure. How you want to do this? Mm, well, we should probably gather up some wood. Melly went to step off the tracks, but Tony saw her and grabbed her arm, pulling her back towards him away from the edge. Melly, stay on the tracks. Tony, it's only during the trials that we have to stay on the tracks. We need supplies. Plus, the little pebbles on the side of the tracks are probably fine to walk on. Well, we can use spells and try and find supplies close by, but no one should be leaving the tracks. It's too risky, Melly. All right, well then, we're going to need some wood. Melly smiled and gestured to Jake, Luke, and Ege. You boys want to try and gather up some firewood? Sure, Melly. Melly gestured to Keith, Rose, and Dawn and made a motion with her hands. Will you try and find some rocks to make the fire pit? Coming right up. Chrissy, Allie, John, do you think you could try and conjure up some sort of food or herbs? We can look through my book for herbal remedies and such, but we'll need some water and a cauldron. Well, Tony and I will take care of that. Cool. Let's start looking, guys. They started looking through her book while Keith's group came back with some rocks that they organized into a circle. Tony, 
Can we borrow your cauldron? Sure, Melly. I don't know how we're going to make it bigger, though. Tony pulled his little black cauldron out of his bag and handed it to her. He was curious to see what she would do with it, and he wanted to learn everything he could from her. So he watched her very closely to what she did and how she did it. Magic, of course. Oh, really? This I've got to see. Melly just smiled and set the small cauldron on the rocks, then looked in her book that she had in her own bag. She found a page on enlarging things and smiled tapping the little cauldron with her finger. The cauldron grew larger, and Melly stepped back smiling at Tony. Tony was just amazed with how she did that, but some of the others wondered how she knew what to do. She was so young. How was it she seemed so much more experienced than them? Okay, how'd you do that? You think about what you want, and then allow yourself to make it so. Hmm. Cool. And we can all do that. That's what magic is, Tony. Everyone waited for the others to come back. Then they lit the fire and decided what to do about food. They made a soup in the cauldron from ingredients they had and found. Afterwards, they poured the soup into some small jars and shrunk it down, giving some to each person, so they had some food while they continued on their way. Then Melly taught Tony how to shrink and enlarge his cauldron and returned it to him after washing it out. Everyone decided they needed to rest, so they all wrapped their cloaks around them and gathered around close to the fire. Jake, Don, Allie, Luke, and Chrissy gathered on one side of the fire, sitting close together as it began to get dark. Rose, John, Ege, and Keith all sat close together, and then Melly and Tony stood closer to the fire, warming their hands. Everyone was drifting off to sleep, except for Melly and Tony, who stood staring into the flames. Tony saw that Melly looked a little drowsy and came close to her, putting his arm around her back. Are you cold? A little, yeah. I'm okay, though. Thank you. Tony nodded and stepped back, giving her space. He stayed beside her, watching her as she looked into the fire. She glanced over the fire and saw the second group asleep. She glanced back at the four behind Tony and smiled. They were asleep, too. Melly looked at Tony as he glanced at her kindly. His lips curled up on one side, and she kind of smirked, looking back into the flames. You know, it was very kind of you to stick up for me today. I'll never forget what you said. Oh, to Ben and Sam. Well, they were out of line, and it pissed me off. You've done nothing but try and help us. If they couldn't see that, then I'm glad they're gone. Yeah. Melly glanced over at him as he glanced up at her from the fire. You know, they're probably dead. I know. But that's not your concern, Melly. They had a choice, and they decided to leave. Melly looked back into the fire, then looked at Tony and took a step towards him. You know, Tony, today when you lifted them up, I saw something in you I'd never seen before. What's that? It was an animal magic. Have you ever heard of spirit animals? Yes, you, you mentioned that before, but I don't know what mine is. I do. Every caster has one. Mine is a wolf. But yours? Your spirit animal is much more ferocious than mine. What's mine, Melly? You're a panther. Like a black panther. How do you know? Because it came out in you today. In your eyes, in your face, and in your actions. You had a power so strong that we could feel it and we were standing behind you. Really, Melly? Tony turned and faced her with a smile as she returned the look smiling kindly back at him. Yes, Tony. When I saw you today, when the animal inside of you came out through your anger, I saw a great and powerful king. <laughs> a king, huh? Oh, yes. I'm no king. Perhaps not, but you're definitely not a duck. You're more worthy than any king I've ever seen. Tony stepped towards her and ran his fingers gently up her arm, then tipped her chin up with his fingers. And how many kings have you seen? Melly looked away from him and stood sideways facing the fire. Probably far fewer than you have queens. <laughs> Tony kind of chuckled and put a hand on the small of her back. Try me. I'll bet you'll be surprised. Yeah, maybe. Her eyes shimmered in the dim moonlight as the fire in front of them began to burn down. She turned to face him and he let his arms rest around her hips as she looked up into his eyes for something that she wasn't entirely sure was there. She didn't know what that something was, but her heart told her that he had it. Tony was slightly nervous as he held Melly close to him. She made him so nervous, but in the best of ways. She rested her head against his chest, and he rested his chin on top of her head. 
Whatever perfume or lotion she was wearing gave off an intoxicating scent, and Tony took deep breaths slowly, breathing it in as he held her there. They stood there a while, not saying much of anything, until finally Melly stepped back and took a deep breath. Thinking he may have made her uncomfortable, Tony spoke quietly to her with a gentle, somber expression on his face. You didn't ask me. Ask you what? How many queens I'd seen. Oh, another night, perhaps. We should probably rest for now. Probably. I'm sorry if I made you feel like... She cut off his sentence and came up close to him, touching his chest gently as she leaned up on her tiptoes and whispered in his ear, Don't worry, you didn't. I promise. She kissed his cheek just below where his ear and jawline met, then smiled up at him. I'm just not in the mindset for a conversation like that right now. Tony slightly smiled, feeling better, understanding exactly what she meant. I understand. <laughs> I knew you would. Melly hugged him and he held her a moment before she walked over towards where the others were resting. Melly sat down beside Rose, and Tony sat beside Melly. Tony rested his head on his arm, and Melly did the same facing him. He smiled as she did, and they closed their eyes and went to sleep. The next morning, Melly woke up just as the sunlight popped up over the horizon. She sat up and looked around, counting everyone. Everyone was safe and asleep. Melly looked at Rose, who was clinging on to John's arm tightly. She giggled, and then looked over at Tony, who was smiling in his sleep dreamingly. He looked so cute as he laid there asleep in his own little dream world. Melly rubbed his arm, trying to gently wake him up, and she quietly spoke to him as she did. Tony. Wake up, Tony. Tony slowly opened his eyes and smirked at her sitting up. Hi, Melly. Hi, Tony. I'm thinking it's time we wake up and get moving. Tony sat up and brushed himself off, then started waking people up. They picked up their camp and walked down the tracks, headed towards the forest of darkness. The plan was to hold hands again and pass through the forest even though they couldn't see. They slowly passed through into the forest, but the problem came when they started feeling people reaching out and grabbing at their feet and such. Some of the hands felt old and wrinkly, some felt cold and clammy, but the ones made them scream, the ones that scared them the most, were the ones that were dripping wet and grabbing at their faces. They had to rush through blindly and just hope they stayed on the tracks, but the hands feeling them up and coming out of nowhere were scaring them and pinching them, and clawing at their bodies. They rushed through the darkness completely blind as a deep rumble coming from within the forest also made them deaf. The girls screamed and slapped at the hands blindly. The boys tried punching their way through, but the more they fought, the more the hands fought back. They pinched and pulled their hair and yanked at the clothing they wore and slapped whatever they could reach. There was moaning and groaning that gave the illusion that other people were around them, but the truth was... They were all alone except for the person in front of them and the person behind them on the tracks. They ran quickly down the tracks until one of the girls tripped. Two of the guys pulled her to her feet and they continued following in line down the tracks. They were like human train cars following the one in front of them in an attempt to make it through the darkness and back into the light. By the time they finally got out, it was sunset and an entire day had gone by. They didn't lose anyone, but they were all exhausted and ready to sleep. They quickly set up their camp and fell asleep as the sun went down. The next morning was quiet as the sun rose in the trees. Melly opened her eyes to find herself bundled up against Tony's back, and Rose had her back up against Melly. Melly sat up and looked around, then jumped a little as Tony sat up beside her. So, you couldn't sleep either? Not really, but it's time to get up anyway. Were you cold? A little, but I'm sure everyone else was too. True but next time, tell me. Why? We're partners. I want to have your back like I know you have mine. Melly smiled and nodded, then stood up and dusted herself off. Tony got up and helped her pick up and wake everyone. Then they decided to get in a little caster practice. Many of the nature casters gathered together and tried practicing different things, as did the shadow casters. Melly kind of watched from the sidelines as each person tried a new technique and practiced on their own, yet together. They individually practiced, but the way they moved was as if they were one. Tony wanted to practice with his knife. He'd owned knives before, but this knife was different for him. He never thought he'd ever have to use a knife on another person or creature, and the thought of it was disturbing to him at first. That was, 
until he held the knife in his hand and pictured it. Melly watched him from a short distance as he moved with the knife in a very graceful motion. It may have been a lethal weapon, but Tony didn't use it that way. To him, it was more like an extension of his arm, and he would use it as such. Melly walked over and put a hand on his shoulder, and he jerked, turning towards her. Melly gasped and stepped back, raising her hand to her mouth. Tony realized he'd startled her and put his knife away, flipping it into his belt sheath, then stepping towards her with his hands out in front of him. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to startle you. I'm sorry, too. I obviously startled you. I was just curious about what you were doing. Just mentally preparing myself for if I ever need to use this thing. You say I'm a fighter, but I've never harmed a soul in my life. Well, as true as that may be, one can be of peaceful mind and nature and still have a bite to back them up. It's often the gentlest of people, Tony, that you don't want to see angry. And you're not a fool, are you? Well, no, I don't think so. Good. Rule number nine. Never take anything for granted. Only a fool wastes a good thing he's been handed. Tony smiled and nodded, but then his smile vanished and he looked down at her with sorrow. What's wrong, Tony? I feel that I frightened you when I got angry with Ben and Sam, and now that's the only way you will see me. Oh, no, Tony. I know how you are. You're gentle and kind, even affectionate when you want to be. I feel you'll be a very powerful caster someday, and I hope I'll be there to see it. Tony stepped forward and put his arms around her, hugging her for a moment tightly. She didn't know how to respond, so she just stood there letting him hug her. I'm sorry. Promise you won't think less of me. He stepped back and looked at her with a kind smile. Why would I think less of you? I don't know. I just... I want to tell you something, and I don't want you to think less of me, okay? I promise. Tony came close and whispered quietly beside her ear. I was thinking of how you've protected us along this trip, and I wanted to be able to help if I'm needed. I care about you, Melissa, and if you need me, that's why I was practicing with my knife. You were able to take out that dark spirit like it was nothing. I'm trying to come to terms with if I ever had to take a life or do the same thing. I know I probably don't have the stones for it yet, but I don't want to hesitate and be the reason you get hurt. I don't want to fail you. Oh, Tony. Melly put her arms up around his neck and hugged him as he wrapped his arms around her sides and back. He let his hands fall against her back and head as he held her close for a moment, just trying to come to terms with his emotions. He was scared. Not of dying, but of Melly getting hurt again. He didn't know why he was scared, but he sure as hell wasn't going to let that happen. You will do wonderfully, I'm sure. You won't fail me. I have the utmost confidence in you. Tony stepped back and smiled at her. Thank you, Melly. And thank you, Tony, for having my back. Now, if you're going to practice, maybe you could use someone to practice against. Tony smiled as she took a stance facing him, ready for any move he might make. But before they could start, Jake and Luke ran over to them. Melissa! Tony! We found something. It's, it's horrible. What is it? What did you find? It's Ben and Sam. They're, they're dead. We found them a ways down the tracks. Wait, you found them in the gate zone? Yes, that's not all. Everyone, let's move out. We're no longer safe here. Stay together and stay close. They walked down the tracks a ways towards the Forest of Mirrors. But before they entered the forest, they found Ben and Sam's bodies just outside the entrance. And that concludes chapter 8. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed. If you haven't already, subscribe below. The very next chapter is called The Forest of Mirrors, and it's coming out very, very soon. Thank you to everyone who is liking and subscribing and commenting on all of the shorts and the videos and everything. I love you guys very much and appreciate everything you guys are doing to support the channel. Thank you, and until next time. Bye.